Let us pray for illumination as we listen for what the Spirit is saying to the Church today. Gracious God, in this corner of this city, you sowed a seed of faith and service. You raised up faithful servants in the past to tend it and water it. Inspire us to continue that service. And in the midst of the changing present, show us the way of your unfailing love so that we may be bearers of peace to all we meet. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been listening to passages from the letter of Paul to the Christians in Galatia. These Christian communities had been founded by Paul, but after Paul had left, other evangelists came along with a different message. Those later arrivals said that in order to follow Christ fully, one had to adopt the Jewish tradition since Christ had been Jewish. Paul vehemently opposed this idea and wrote a strong letter to the Galatians explaining his position. He argued that acceptance by God was not dependent on adopting Jewish traditions. So what? This isn't an issue for us. But hold on there. I agree that the issue that Paul faced, that we, whether we need to act like Jews, is not relevant to us, but the principles underlying Paul's response are still applicable. The question for us is not whether Jewish culture has some sort of priority, but whether any particular culture and tradition has priority. Does what God prefer one way over another? And that is a trap that we all fall into. It is easy to think and act that if that person um, is not quite right in God's eyes because they do not behave according to our norms and standards. At Synod yesterday, somebody mentioned something from the history of Methodism as if it were highly treasured. But we all know that Presbyterian heritage is better, don't we? It's easy to find more serious examples. The treatment of the Aborigines by British settlers, the white Australia policy, the attitude towards immigrants from Europe after World War II. And I guess in the last few days, the argument over Brexit and what that means for nationalism in the various countries involved. All these are examples of a notion that a person has to adopt certain culture in order to be acceptable that one culture is superior to another. Paul's firm belief is that God's love is open to all. All are accepted and in a relationship with God regardless of the traditions or cultural background or patterns of behavior. That universal offer of a relationship with all is the foundational thing. It is the first step. How you behave, how a person adapts their traditions to the new relationship with God, these things come next. Some behavior is now inappropriate, but some is helpful. In today's reading, Paul takes this one step further. What lies behind the tendency to think that one set of ways is better than another, or that my mob is better than your mob? Paul sees this as coming from a universal tendency for people to split into rival groups. The human world has a tendency to fracture and split. Our cultures and our worldviews tend naturally to do what is harmful and to bring about damaging attitudes and treatment of other. That is, human culture has that tendency without Christ. In fact, without the example of Christ, we humans don't really know better. Now, Paul uses his own language to describe this situation, and so I've taken the liberty of changing some of the words he uses, of trying to update these into one, something a little more contemporary. For example, I've just talked about harmful attitudes. Paul uses the word flesh to describe this broken worldview. 
but that term is so misleading. It conjures up in our minds images of carnal or sexual indulgence, of bodily pleasures. But that is only part of its meaning, a very small part. Flesh is what happens when you don't have a relationship with God. And it's not chaos, it can be a very ordered society, a very hierarchical society like an empire, but it's also a society that operates on divisions, on scapegoating, on exploiting people and damaging people. So in order to capture this, I've replaced flesh by a harmful worldview or a harmful culture. It's a bit awkward, I admit. I couldn't think of anything better, and that's like version six or seven of what I was doing. But it reminds us that bigotry, self-interest, no matter how mild, is damaging to community. I've also used the term Torah to describe the whole basis of the Jewish culture at the time of Paul uh, for the word that would otherwise be translated law. Not just legal material, but the story of the people of Israel, slavery in Egypt, renew, res rescue by God, and the covenant with Sinai and so on. That is the Torah, the law. Thank you, Dharma. Galatians 5.1, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as a lucky break for the harmful culture that surrounds you, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole Torah is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If However, you bite and devour one another. Take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and you will not support the priority of the harmful culture. For what the harmful worldview desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to a harmful world view. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the Torah. Now the works of a harmful culture that surrounds you are obvious fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the harmful worldview with its patience and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Our Gospel reading for this day is a bit of a mix. 
It consists of a very short story concerning a Samaritan village, followed by three odd and loosely connected sayings. The binding theme for these four things is misunderstanding, specifically misunderstanding what it means to follow Jesus. Just before this reading in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke includes a story about the transfiguration of Jesus. That's a, a turning point in Luke's story of Jesus. Jesus had been wandering around, healing and teaching, and now, according to Luke, he begins that journey to Jerusalem and to the cross. Disciples had been with Jesus during those wanderings, and some of them also saw the transfiguration. And then they travel with him to Jerusalem. You'd think that they would have the best understanding of Jesus, but the story shows otherwise. Luke 9:51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, the messengers entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. In sacred words of God, we have heard the Spirit speak anew. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that these human words may be the word of God for us this day, according to your promise, through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Jesus was having a bad day, one of those days. The disciples decided that he must have gotten out of bed on the wrong side. First, there was the incident with that Samaritan village. Jesus had decided to go to Jerusalem. He seemed pretty set on the idea, so he'd sent a couple of disciples ahead of the main group so that they could arrange lodging. They'd stopped at a Samaritan village to make some arrangements, but then Jesus decided to skip that village and push on to the next. The disciples, being good new Jews, were not keen on Samaritans, and they decided that Jesus must share their hatred. So they enthusiastically suggested to Jesus that they order a drone strike with napalm on the village. Okay, so that bit's a bit of poetic license. Call down fire from heaven. Boy, had they copped it from Jesus for their suggestion. And they were just trying to be team players. Next, there was the way Jesus treated some people who came to him offering to be disciples. The first one was told that Jesus had nowhere to stay. Well, that was patently false. He'd had no trouble finding lodging on the journey, and if push came to shove, 
His mother would always take him back. Then there was the person who wanted to bury their parent, as tradition demanded. They were told to let the dead bury the dead. Now, that's impossible. Dead people are not very good at digging holes. And finally, the one who wanted to farewell his family. She was dealt with rather shortly too. It was as if she was told that following Jesus meant being rude to your loved ones. Yep, Jesus sure was testy that day. The reading from the Gospel of Luke that is set for today is a rather strange one. As my somewhat tongue-in-cheek review shows, it's very negative and seems hard to understand. It's contrary to reason, at least, the sort of reasoning the disciples would have made. So what's going on here? What lies behind these four short incidents? Now we can get some insight into these stories in the Gospel if we go back to the reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians that we heard before. Paul contrasts two modes of living. On the one hand, there is life by the Spirit, and this is a worldview and a way of acting shaped by the influence of God's Spirit, a Spirit that results in actions that are loving, joyous, peaceful, kind, generous, and so on. In Paul's mind, and by the way, Paul had a very black and white way of thinking. This contrasts with another sort of worldview. The worldview that we're accustomed to, the worldview based on most of our cultural expectations. And as I said before, in the original Greek of the letter to the Galatians, Paul calls this perspective the flesh, which is not very helpful for us today because that term has so many connotations and mostly it's to do with the individual. So I converted it into something about a harmful worldview, by which I mean a culture, a worldview that thrives on divisions, that loves to put other people down, that has insiders and outsiders, that some people have it and others don't. The outsiders are not considered to have the same value or quality as the insiders. And it's not just comprised of individuals. It describes a way of being community, a very dysfunctional community, based on exclusion and hatred of people who are different. And that's the sort of culture that was alive in Paul's time. It lay behind the notion in Galatia that you had to be Jewish in order to be Christian. And it's also active today. Just listen to some of the rhetoric coming out of the US presidential elections or some of our politicians. According to Paul, what Jesus had done was to demonstrate that God loved everyone, that there were no insiders or outsiders, that everyone could be an insider in God's love in relationship with God. And that knocked the notion of a harmful culture of division on its head. So, argued Paul, one should live according to this new relationship with God. So let's flip back to the reading from Luke. Jesus is trying to teach people about what Paul regards as the culture of the Spirit, the culture of love and acceptance in the relationship with God and others, what the Gospel calls the Kingdom of God the divine community of love. But the disciples don't get this. When they suggest that Jesus destroy the Samaritan village, the disciples are buying into the common notion that Samaritans are bad because they disagree with traditional Judaism. So they think Samaritans deserve to die. No, says Jesus. I have come not to destroy, but to save people. Let go of the idea that it's okay to exploit and damage people who are different from us. They are to be loved as well. When Jesus says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, he's saying that nowhere in that harmful culture is a home place for Jesus or for any follower of Jesus. Rather, the true home for the follower of Jesus is a community that is based around God's love 
for all people and for all creation. And that's not a place out of this world. It is in this world. It is this world looked at through the eyes of care. When Jesus tells that person to go and proclaim the kingdom of God, he's not forbidding them from burying their parent. Rather, he's putting it in perspective. He says, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. The role of the believer is to talk about the God of life and to celebrate life, love and care that God has given to everyone and that cannot be limited by death. We live for life, not for emptiness. And when Jesus talks about putting one's hand to the plough and not looking back, he's encouraging us to be diligent in our commitment to the divine community of love. Back to Paul. For freedom Christ has set us free, he writes. What is our freedom? It is the freedom to make one choice, to choose whether to stand with the spirit or with the power of a culture based on division. Freedom is not about inner peace or lack of oppression or lots of choices. Just one choice, spirit or not. But it's a choice that we have to make every day of our lives. Stand firm, says St Paul, you are called to freedom. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for carelessness, but through love serve one another. Keep your hand on the plough and your eyes ahead, says Jesus in the Gospel. It's the birthday of the Uniting Church, or pretty close to it, the 22nd was the actual day. It's close to the anniversary of Scott's Church in July. Those messages speak to us as a church, as a wider church, the Uniting Church, and as a community here about serving the Spirit, keeping our eyes ahead and not looking back, creating here, in this place, a place, a community of love, a place that others can call home. So let me close with three examples. This weekend was the first meeting of Synod and Presbytery for this year. The morning session yesterday was given over to evangelism. Now I shuddered when I saw that on the program, I have to confess, because I've become so used to sessions on evangelism, talking about the so-called need to go out and tell people that they're sinners and that Jesus saves them. But this session was different. There was much more talk about getting alongside people, about welcoming people, about being helpful and supporting them in their life situation. Not ramming some beliefs down their throats, but at the same time not hiding the fact that we are followers of Jesus. By our actions, a person can learn what that means, what it means to be a follower, and whether it has any value. So evangelism in our life and what we do, not in what we demand. Example two. Earlier in the week, Geoffrey Chappell and I had attended a meeting about the activation of North Terrace. I'm still not sure how you activate a street. Type in a special code? No. But Attendance at the meeting included several businesses along North Terrace, as well as government officials, including the Premier and Deputy Premier. We all had an interest in the development of North Terrace. The other businesses, quite naturally, were ultimately interested in making a profit in dollars. I made it quite clear, possibly too much so, that my interest in the interest of Scott's Church was not in profit in dollars, but in building a community. And in fact, I said this to Jay Wetherill uh, when he sat for about 20 minutes with four of us at a small table discussion. And I was also able to speak with the people responsible for the new residential development replacing Elizabeth House. Our interest is in community. Our profit is community, 
not money. How do we build community? Here at Scots, we've tried to do that repeatedly in many ways. And there's a latest initiative, a new initiative on the horizon. We're planning to embark on an op shop in this building. I won't go into the details, but in July, we hope, the op shop will start functioning. People, many of whom have little or no church background, will come into our building. What happens next is not clear yet, but we hope that over time, groups will form, needs will become apparent, and a new community will crystallize. Scots will bear the fruit of the Spirit in new and exciting ways. For freedom, Christ has set us free. The only freedom we have is to choose to whom we belong, to God or to self-serving and empty norms of our society. If we choose God, then we are also choosing a goal and a purpose, to serve others, to love our neighbours as ourselves, to actively cultivate the fruits of the Spirit that Paul lists. Now we have gathered here this morning to worship God. We have chosen to belong to God, and with that choice, we have chosen to serve and care for each other, and to extend that care to all those out there, beyond our walls, all who pass by our corner. So let's get on with it. Amen.